is it, is it no, I, I mean this. I, I, I do believe we have four levels of self. You know? If you pay attention, we have a self that we use. It's a language we use, body language we use uh, for public encounters, right? right. The face that we uh, unfold, the voice that we use, the, the vocabulary we use, the body that we, that we use in public. Then there's a self, a voice, a language, a body language, whatever we use in private, right? That is with uh, you know, family members, uh, close friends. So there's a, th that social self that I mentioned first. Then there's this private self, right? Then there's this secret self, right? That we are with ourselves, We're in secret, nobody. You know, we pick our nose, we masturbate, whatever it is we do in secret, right? There's that self, right? And then, I am, I, I'm convinced, there's a completely unknown self that is unknown to even ourselves. Now, it seems to me that all the poems that I love to read, and all the poems that I grew up loving and continue to love, are the poems that somehow account for all four of those selves. That the voice that comes through, like if you hear a great poem by the Tang Dynasty poets, the Chinese Tang Dynasty, they're speaking on a social level, but they're also speaking on a private level, uh, and a secret level, and then there's some sort of unknown knowledge seeping up through that poem. And I think, and, and I feel that that paradigm of those four selves is a pretty comprehensive paradigm of what a, what a piece of art can do. I know there are a lot of poems that, that aren't in touch with the unknown self. That to me is a problem. They think there's only these three selves, you know, the public, the private, and the secret. There's nothing beyond that. And some, I think some beautiful poems are, can be written in that way, but they're not, I don't think they're the poems that last. So I, I suppose I mean <clears throat> when we write poems that we're, um, I think when we're in touch with the multitude is that unknown self. This sleeplessness is not my sleeplessness. It must be the stars in Sonia, and I am their earthbound descendant. This loneliness is no one's. No one was never born and will never die. This sadness belongs to someone else. Sad because he's always someone else. For so many years, I answered to a name, and I can't say who answered. Mr. Undercover? Sister Every Secret Thing? Anybody? Somebody? Somebody says, with a stranger for a father, how could thinking be anything but restless? Somebody says, God, I turn my hand face down, and you are you, and I am me. I turn my hand face up, and you are the I, and I am your thee. What happens when you turn your hand? Someone, anyone, no one, me, and someone else. Five in a bed, and none of us can sleep. Five in one body, begotten, not made. And the gloom we bear together is none of ours. So maybe it's yours, God, for living so near to your creatures, for suffering so many incarnations unknown to yourself, for remaining strange to friends and lovers, and then outliving them and all of their names for you. For living sometimes for years without a name, and all of your springtimes disheveled, and all of your winters, one winter. Wow. You know, my own experience is that art has any um, has art has two lives. The one life, I, I would say, is rooted in a life of a scarcity, 
right? It's publication, mm -hmm. awards, jobs, prizes. Whatever. There are only so many awards, right? There are only so many places are going to publish it. There are only so many jobs, only so many, you know, places to publish it, and so on. So that whole thing is a life of scarcity, right? And there's something uh, <clears throat> hell-making about entering into that. Uh, it's like hell, you know. Uh, but art has this other life, this life of abundance. It seems it has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. It's like I can work on a poem the rest of my life and not get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm trying to. Uh, there are poems that, that are 30 years old and I still can't get them right. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm just. I, I, there are poems I've published. I keep writing. And I feel like this is my life with the work. It's this life of abundance. It just keeps going. Mm -hmm. Then there's this other life that I, you know, my editor calls and says, your book's a year and a half late, what's up? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. that that's, that, that's just a, an unfortunate necessity, I, I, or fortunate, whatever, you know. But it's, that's a whole other world, and you have to deal with it. But I understand that it's, that world is a life, the paradigm there is a paradigm of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And the paradigm of art is, is in fact, the paradigm of abundance. You know, the first line of this poem came from something I said to my son. He was studying piano with my sister. And she taught him the, the little mnemonic device, you know, every good boy. What, yeah. What is it? Every good boy has time. Right. Um, and he asked me, he said, is that true, Baba? He was very small. And I said, no. <laughs> The truth is, every wise child is sad. He's fine. Right. He's kind of normal, but uh, but I thought, you know, why did I tell him that? I thought I, I, thought, I, thought I was like, educating him or something. Like that. But but I wrote this poem. And that's the first line of this poem. This is called "Tearing the Page." It comes from watching him color. And he colored with so much passion, he'd just go right through the page, you know, and then he'd be heartbroken, and then he'd mess with the drawing. This is called Tearing the Page. <laughs> Every wise child is sad. Every laughing child is forgetful. Every solitary child rules the earth. And the child who can't sleep learns to count. And the child who counts negotiates between limit and longing, infinity and subtraction. Every child who listens all night to the wind finds his breathing turns a wheel to leave no trace and though he can't tell what a minute weighs, or if an hour is too little or too long, he's sure the play he's called away from each evening is the beginning and end of order in a human household. He knows his counting to himself and his rising and falling ball are appointed by ancient laws his own heart tides obey. But he can't tell anybody what he knows. Every wise child is heartbroken. Every wind-strewn flower is God-tearing God. And the stars are leaves blown across my grandmother's lap. And of time's many hands, he can't tell the bloody from the perfume, the hands that rip from the hands that mend. But he knows about goodbyes, some of them anyway. The goodbye at the front door each morning, a kiss for a kiss. The goodbye at bedtime, stories and songs until it's safe to close his eyes. And maybe he's even sat in the waiting room at Union Station where dust and echoes climb to the great skylights, accompanied by farewells of the now-going 
to join the farewells of the long gone. As old as night itself, he's not old enough in the morning to heat his milk on the stove. Old enough to knot his shoelaces, he's not old enough to unknot them. Old enough to know to close the window when it storms. Old enough to know the rain, given the chance, would fall on him and darken him. The way he himself colors the figures he draws, pressing so hard he tears the page. But, uh, you know, the ancients said this thing. Um, they said we have a composite nature and a prime nature. Prime numbers are numbers that are only divisible by one and itself. Right? A composite number is uh, basically a number that is a version of other numbers. Right? The number 12, it's a version of six. It's a version of two. It's a version of four. It's a version of three. They're, we as persons are that way too. We are composite on the one hand, and we are prime. There is that thing about us that is a version of our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our generation, uh, whatever country you're in. You know, you're a version of young people in college in the United States. So we're all versions, right? So even when you read like a Cinderella, uh, you might be a version of Cinderella. You read uh, Brave Taylor. You're a version of right there. When you read Odysseus, you're, those are all versions of, of us, right? So we're composite that way, and it's deep. Nobody's suggesting that we should turn our backs on that. But there is another version of us. There is another part of us, an aspect of us that is prime. That is, you're not divisible by anybody. You're not understandable. You're not a version of your father. You're not a version of your mother. You're not a version of your sister, your brother, your friends. You're not a version of your class, you're not a version of your gender. You're so absolutely unique. Now, it seems to me that when we study mostly in education, what we do is we study composites, right? We're all trying to be versions of the canon. We don't really know how to educate for primacy. And I think art is the only way to educate for primacy. You know, but you can't do it by turning your back on the composite. You have to study the composite, right? You have to understand why we are versions of, all of us are versions of Cinderella, why all of us are versions of Brave Terry, why we're all versions of Odysseus, why we're all versions of Jacob, why we're all versions, I mean, those are all our composites. So it's important to study our, you know, the versions, but it's also important to get this primacy down. And it seems to me that when art enters into the realm of scarcity and academics and stuff, the danger of that is there's a lot of composite making there, right? We want to see, like, he belongs to this school. We understand her by this lens. And so we're all looking at things in terms, you know, as though they're versions of others, right? Which is true, because, you know, nobody is born out ahead of Zeus. I mean, nobody writes a poem. It's all based on other. But on the other hand, it's, it's a double thing, you know? So it seems to me that entering into that exclusively, that life of scarcity, is a little dangerous because it so emphasizes the composite nature of our, our, our beings. You know? Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. 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 That primacy. <laughs> I, I don't think that primacy right. just, and, and it's harder than you think. You might think, oh, you know, I'm being me. Take a look. You look just like everybody else who's being you. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And you say, well, I like this kind of music. It makes me really unique, except that 10 million other people like that, too. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. like, the, the version of primacy that we get, we haven't even examined it. You know, we haven't really gotten down to it. And it seems to me that art is the only way to it. There is no other way to educate for primacy. Uh, but we don't understand art. You know, we think it means, I don't know. Just, I, I don't know wh how, you know. But it just seems to me it's dangerous to only educate for one thing. Mm -hmm. when in fact, we have these two natures. Now, the ancients, this is what's interesting. The ancients said, you will never even get near your prime nature unless you make contact with the unknown self. That fourth one. 
because the social self, the private self, and even the secret self are finally only composites. So you have, for instance, you know, you have your secret sexual fantasy, right? Guess what? Eight million people have. So even that secret self isn't even as prime as you think. Unless you make contact with that unknown self, they say, you're just hovering around in this world of versions and composites of other people. And you don't even know it. You don't even know it. You're just early in the morning. While the long grain is softening in the water, gurgling over a low stove flame, before the salted winter vegetable is sliced for breakfast, before the birds, my mother glides an ivory comb through her hair, heavy and black as calligrapher's ink. She sits at the foot of the bed. My father watches, listens for the music of comb against hair. My mother combs, pulls her hair back tight, rolls it around two fingers, pins it in a bun to the back of her head. For half a hundred years, she has done this. My father likes to see it like this. He says it is kempt, but I know it is because of the way my mother's hair falls when he pulls the pins out, easily like the curtains when they untie them in the evening. First time we, we met, that was the first thing I was impressed is that he only speaks with such authentic Mandarin accent as if he grew up in Beijing, better than many you know people who come from that city speak the like, speak the language that way. So that's why yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it created an impact. So we, we kind of immediately connected that, and because you you're you're a traveler like I am, you travel you know, all across the globe. And so, you know, the abundance or the multiplicity has something to do with these two cultures. Well, I was wondering what kind of, um, you know, talk freely about the, the Chinese aspect of you. Yeah. Well, I, I speak it because my mother refused to, you, you, when we came to this country, you know, I, I, at the time, I resented her a little bit, but now I, I'm just seeing she was so strong. A lot of the people that came to this country at the same time that we did, they wanted their children to assimilate. You know, they could speak English, learn English. We will not speak to Chinese. My mother did not. She said, I will not speak to you unless you speak Chinese to me. And so we kept our Chinese up. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't speak any Chinese. Most of the people I meet in my generation who came don't speak Chinese. You know, so it's because of her. But the Chinese tradition is just so rich. You know, my father raised me to study Chinese alchemy. You know. Yeah, breathing, moving, trying to, you know, uh, Chinese martial arts, Chinese uh, probably calligraphy, calligraphy, painting, calligraphy, painting, reciting poems. You know. you know, they both knew the, uh, the uh, what is it, Tang Shu San They all knew that. 300, yeah, both recited. Uh, both of my parents were cited, Zhuang Zi, Mao Zi, you know. They were classically educated. They, they used to do this thing, my, 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 that generation, my parents' generation, every time fa the family would get together, they'd sit at a big you know, Chinese restaurant table with like 20 people. And mm. The oldest one would uh, say like two, po uh, two lines of one way. Oh. And yeah, turn to the other poet, yeah. to the, and they would have to say the next two lines. And if you didn't know the two lines, you're admitting so a lot, you know, the adults in my, when I was growing up, they knew so much about poetry and philosophy, and they really loved it and honored it. In sixth grade, Mrs. Walker slapped the back of my head and made me stand in the corner for not knowing the difference between persimmon and precision. How to choose persimmons. This is precision. 
Ripe ones are soft and brown spotted. Sniff the bottoms. The sweet one will be fragrant. How to eat. Put the knife away. Lay down newspaper. Peel the skin tenderly, not to tear the meat. Chew the skin, suck it, and swallow. Now, eat the meat of the fruit, so sweet, all of it, to the heart. Donna undresses. Her stomach is white. In the yard, dewy and shivering with crickets, we lie naked, face up, face down. I teach her Chinese, crickets, choo-choo, do, I've forgotten, naked, I've forgotten, me, wo, you, and me. I part her legs, remember to tell her she is beautiful as the moon. Other words that got me into trouble were fight and fright, ren and yarn. Fight was what I did when I was frightened. Fright was what I felt when I was fighting. Wrens are small, plain birds. Yarn is what one knits with. Wrens are soft as yarn. My mother made birds out of yarn. I loved to watch her tie the stuff. A bird, a rabbit, a wee man. Mrs. Walker brought a persimmon to class and cut it up so everyone could taste a Chinese apple. Knowing it wasn't ripe or sweet, I didn't eat, but watched the other faces. My mother said every persimmon has a sun inside, something golden, glowing, warm as my face. Once in the cellar, I found two wrapped in newspaper forgotten and not yet right. I took them and set both on my bedroom windowsill, where each morning a cardinal sang, the sun, the sun. Finally understanding, he was going blind. My father sat up all one night, waiting for a song, a ghost. I gave him the persimmons, swelled, heavy as sadness, and sweet as love. This year, in the muddy lighting of my parents' cellar, I rummage, looking for something I lost. My father sits on the tired wooden stairs, black cane between his knees, hand over hand, gripping the handle. He's so happy that I've come home. I ask how his eyes are, a stupid question. All gone, he answers. Under some blankets, I find a box. Inside the box, I find three scrolls. I sit beside him and untie three paintings by my father. Hibiscus leaf and a white flower. Two cats preening. Two persimmons so full they want to drop from the cloth. He raises both hands to touch the cloth, asks, which is this? This is persimmons, father. Oh, the feel of the wolf tail on the silk, the strength, the tense precision in the wrist. I painted them hundreds of times, eyes closed. These I painted blind. Some things never leave a person. Scent of the hair of one you love. The texture of persimmons in your palm. The right weight. Thank you.